Hey everybody, it's Addy, co-host of the Denoise podcast. And in today's episode, I'm gonna show you how I made this cinematic sequence here. Oh, dust and shadow, they follow me close. Every step I take, every ghost I pose, dust and shadow. Okay, and let me show you my performance side by side so you can see where all this originated from. Oh, dust and shadow, they follow me close. Every step I take, every ghost I pose, dust and shadow. So in this video, we're gonna break it down step by step so you too can do this at home. And particularly, we're gonna go through the workflow. And what I mean by that is the tool sets that are used in the manner in which they are used. And so first, let's get into it. Here are the primary tools on the screen here. A lot of the image generation and the compositing was done with Google's Nano Banana Pro. And the actual video generation itself was done with an open source model called One 2.2 Animate. And finally, some touch-ups with Adobe Lightroom as well as DaVinci Resolve and then editing in Premiere as well. And finally, for a little bit of audio, I use Suno, which uh, we'll get into as well. So in order for me to verify that all of this would work, I actually took one small test shot and creatively I was inspired by Marlboro Man campaigns of the past and Clint Eastwood movies and spaghetti westerns and all those things that are sort of a little bit dated and are, are a relic. I wanted to just harken back to that era. So here you have a image of <laughs> me having a cigar in a very rugged Western environment. You, and I'm wearing obviously a cowboy outfit. These are some of the mood boards that I generated in the beginning. So let me show you the origination of my test shot, which I think you'll find quite hilarious. So I wanted to have a cigar without having a cigar. So I wanted to have the smoke and the light of the cigar, but just pretend like I was smoking. So this is the camera angle that I was going for. It was kind of a low perspective looking up at me. And this is the input image that I used. And after a bunch of Nana Banana sort of iterations, I finally came up with this outfit that I really liked. It was, again, as you could see, it's me having a, a, a lit cigar in my mouth with a black cowboy hat, a red bandana, and a very generic cowboy outfit. But I'm still in my living room, so I wanna accurately place myself in the background that I just showed you with the right camera perspective. So after a few attempts, I was able to get something like this. And I was really happy with the way that the sun had relit me in that environment. So the challenge of all of this was to really do three things, which is to do costume replacement, background replacement, and then relight the character in the background. These are all classic VFX things that are done day in and day out with traditional tools. And I wanted to attempt to do it with AI tools and see how far I can get what the quality looks like. And so that was the whole goal for all of this. So with this shot, I did two different methods of testing. So the first thing was just taking this single image and putting it through an image to video model and letting the model just figure out the animation, if you will, the motion. And this is what it looked like. <laughs> the cigar disappears over here and then a new cigar appears. And for some reason, there's whistling in the audio, which I probably won't be using. Uh, but in general, this is just, just, just not like a disappearing cigar is really hard to recover from. Okay, so that was my test. So I went back to one 2.2 Animate. The reason for that is I believe to get the best possible quality out of AI, you still have to retain human performance. Although I'm not an actor, I think having me as an input and then mapping my performance to an output where I am recostumed and in a new environment would yield me the best results. So that was my theory and that's what I went with. Although the quality is there, it's really hard to control what my movement and my motions and my emotions would be 
Whereas if I had my real performance as an input, as a backbone, then I would have significant impact on the overall output. I just took a camera on a tripod and then I wanted to go through creatively the nervous hesitation before a gunfight. I think in Western movies, you see heroes sort of be this super brave, super heroic person, but in reality, I think uh, if any of us were to go through a gunfight, we'd be significantly scared and nervous. So I want to capture that in a bunch of shots, tie the shots together cohesively and call it a sequence. So here are some of my shots. As you can see here, I'm pensively sort of looking around, camera is static, and then I tie it to another shot of me sort of just still wondering if I should actually go in there and get myself killed. And then... Finally, uh, at the very end, uh, there's a shot of me just kind of closing in on the camera as I'm entering the saloon. And um, as you could see side by side, once again, let's play it back for you. This is the result that I got. It's about a, and you could see here that the performance, the output of the performance is retained because the input is my geometry, and what I mean by that is my dimensions and my body and my sort of physicality, and the output is the same. So I didn't remind myself to another person because I knew some of the performance would be lost. Everything from the angle of my arm to the expression on my face is, is all retained. That's because I pick myself as an input and I also pick myself as an output to minimize the error in the transfer. Uh, if that makes any sense. In the motion capture world, that is uh, called retargeting. It's typically done with a lot of math. And with AI, it's going to probably try to guess and refit my performance into another person's dimensions. So in order to mitigate that, I just took myself as an input and myself as the output. So theoretically, the retargeting should be zero. Um, so as you can see here, um, I'm pretty happy with the physicality of the results. All my like in this in this shot here, if we kind of just slowly watch it frame by frame, you could see my right hand tuck into my left elbow, and if you look at it in real time, boom, that's perfect. Like it just goes in that pocket, just like in that performance. These subtle nuances is what gives the output photorealism and authenticity, and I think I've retained it. Okay, so now it's time to build the assets. So I would break down the asset building into three categories. First, the character generations, then the background generations, and finally putting those two things together in what I call compositing. And so for the character generations, I just took some photos of myself and then put in myself into various outfits until I was really happy with this outfit. I love the red bandana peeking underneath the cowboy hat, a really worn down, dirty look on my leather vest and my denim pants and so on. So I made my image in four different views. So front and then three quarter, as well as the back view and finally the side view. Because if you go back to the shots, these are the specific views that the shot originated in. So I, I wanted to make sure that the AI didn't have to second guess that starting frame, that I gave it as much information as I could. So once we did that, then we got into the background. So really, it's just one single environment, which is this saloon here that you see. And here, there's just too many lanterns on the wall and it just also looks really sparse so after a few iterations i went into um, the following and i was finally happy with it so as you could see here i generated some additional city blocks if you will on the background um, some more information here and finally i got rid of all those lamps i just had this one hero lamp which i thought would give me really nice lighting and relight me in a convincing way some of the artifacts that i wasn't too happy with is this ambiguous light spot here that i don't know what that is and also i just couldn't get the patio to be wider so this is as wide as the patio got i ideally i wanted to go a little bit longer than that but all in all, I think this is going to go through really fast. It's only a few seconds and you're not really going to notice it. I love the golden hour sort of dusk look here on the sky and the clouds. So that's what I was going for and really happy with it.
And then I wanted to do a reverse of that saloon entrance. And after a few iterations, this is what I came up with for the opposite view, the reverse angle. Um, again, loving the matching, uh, the matching golden hour here, as well as the city block going into the distance. And then uh, the text doesn't seem too bothersome to me. <laughs> You know, like I, I would maybe want to put a brand of a bank than just bank. Uh, but again, we're nitpicking here. This is also going to fly by so fast. You're not going to notice it in the background. Love that they kept the light on top. Remember that little lantern um, that I showed you in the other angle? Well, it kept some of that, which is great. It's going to help sort of mold the two angles together in edit. Okay, now that I had it, now it's time for compositing. So putting the character in the background and specifically putting it into the right camera perspective that my performance originated from. So I was playing around and this is part of the creative iteration and this is one of the generations that I absolutely loved. It just felt right for all the right reasons. Uh, the bandana went from my forehead down to my neck, which I think is more of a stereotypical cowboy look. And uh, the inside shirt is just much more dirty, and it's a black shirt with brown stains, which I thought was more appropriate. The hat looks way dirtier as well. And then the, the lighting in the background, you know, is just much more realistic to me. So I was like... You know what? I'm going to change everything around. So I did another whole version of background and foreground generations, and then I landed on my following input images. For all of the shots that are using my front view looking out into that street, this is what I used. And again, uh, some of the stuff that I really loved here is like the lighting on my shoulder and my face, perhaps a little bit too much on my shoulder, but it's still very, I think it's gonna look really well when it's in motion. And then uh, uh, again, the background here and here, as well as the golden hour lighting, it's all good, love it. And uh, I had to then flip myself, put my back towards the saloon, so this is the composite that I then came up with for the other angle. And again, this is gonna, I'm gonna apply a zoom and post. So you're not gonna re really see the perimeter of this, nor the lamp, but uh, it's again, this is a really nice touch, but yeah, the lamp is there, the saloon door is there, and uh, the rest of the town can be seen there. Still not a fan of this mystery light here, but I don't think you'll notice it, okay. So finally, just a couple more inserts in there for image generation. I had a side shot of me here, as you could see. And again, uh, if you look at the face, it's starting to lose me a little bit. I don't look like that, at least to me anyway. But I think the generation, because it's originating from my face uh, as a video input, will self-correct a little bit, at least I'm hoping for it. Um, AI works in mysterious ways, so let's find out. But uh, this is this is also another angle that I'm really happy with. And then finally, there was a shot of me walking three quarters sort of past the camera. So I wanted to give the model an image of me in a three quarter pose. Although Wand 2.2 can figure out how to re-rotate you and kind of reposition you, the more information you give it, the less hard it has to work. The less it works, the better your output will look. So Nana Banana did the heavy lifting of sort of angling me and sort of figuring out the parts and sides of my body and face that weren't visible. So Wand 2.2 doesn't have to do some of that work. I'd rather have Nana Banana do the second guessing and regenerate and Wand 2.2 just animate so it works less, if that makes sense. Okay. So now that it's done, uh, now we're ready to generate. So I'm on Comfy Cloud. Now Comfy UI is probably the gold standard for any sort of AI workflows, specifically in film and TV and other industries as well. So I have my WAN 2.2 14 billion parameter model loaded up here. So I'm gonna just zoom in and show you. These are all the models that are loaded, not just the model itself, but the clip encoder and the LoRa's. We have a very specific video that we shot just for this workflow. I'll link to it down below if you're interested in the details of this. But for now, I just wanted to quickly show you that once we have our image and our video performance, the next step is to go into WAN 2.2 and start churning it and start generating those videos. So 
Although I could use WAN 2.2 in Comfy Cloud, which is what you're seeing here, for a little bit faster throughput, and because this is a really simple use case and I did a lot of the homework, I actually use FAL. So FAL is an online AI platform where you're essentially renting GPUs. And um, trust me, the GPUs are going to be way better than the ones you have at home. We're talking about A100s, h 100 some of the best GPUs that are used for AI today. So within FAL, you can find the same workflow. So if you go, let's see, on my recently used, these are... So this is the FAL 1, 2.2, 14B Animate Move workflow, specifically Animate has two different workflows. Move is the one that's doing um, the animation and the background swapping. So all you do is upload one single image and that video sequence and you hit run and off it goes. Once I was done with 1, 2.2, then I brought it into Resolve, which I'll show you here. So in Resolve, I did some color correction as you could see, and um, it really is just taking down a lot of the, uh, the the AI sheen of it and kind of shifting it in the favor of cinematic, in my opinion. AI generations, I mean, if you're looking at Nano Banana outputs, they tend to be heavily contrasted. They tend to be overly saturated, uh, often missing grain, missing vignetting, missing lens distortion. Um, there's not much we can do about filling skin details, um, at least not at the moment. I used Resolve's Upscaler to mitigate some of that. Uh, but as you could see in my Resolve color correction here, I tried to take it a little bit into the cinematic world. So now that I have done my color grading, I'm now fully editing it in Resolve, just dropping each of the clips into where my input clips were. So it's gonna be frame accurate because I did use the source frame rate, which was 30 frames per second, four by generation. So when I dropped it back into Resolve, it all lined up. So now you have the final sequence here. And finally, for music, I just quickly went into Suno. I think a lot of you are already familiar with Suno. This is a very popular platform, not just for creating music, but also discovering music. They have a built-in social network website. So for me, I really wanted a rugged, husky male voice to just like really hammer in a emotional moment. And after a few tries, this is the song that I loved. Again, it's spot on, in my opinion, for the creative that I was after. All right, so this is all put together. And again, I'm going to show you the final output here. Oh, dust and shadow, they follow me close. Every step I take. Well, thanks for watching. And if you love this video, then give us a like and give us a comment. Let us know what you think. For more AI development news, commentary, and just plain fun, follow us on the Denoise podcast with Joey and I every week. All right, till the next one.